For all there we all would take a decade of the rosary to say it. And then little by little as different ones went away and there wasn't a whole of five there for the five decades, sometimes she would just take two and just say, just keep going saying it. And did you, um, did you ever have the Stations of the Cross at your house? Uh, we didn't have Stations of the Cross, but we did have Mass in the house. It was kind of like mandatory once a year uh -huh. that you would um, you'd be asked by the priest, the canon, uh, if you would uh, have Mass in the house. And that was a big, big event because, you know, to have the priest come into your house, you'd have to... Right. That's not called Stations of the Cross. No, the Mass they, yeah. over there. And... Um, that was a big event, you know, the house had to be all cleaned and whitewashed and the best linen had to be pulled out if you did have it, and the best china. And only a few certain people got to sit at the table with the priest, somebody who could hold a conversation with him, and like an adult, or, um, you know, somebody in, in the family. And um, after the Mass, there was breakfast served and it was, uh, and then the priest would go around to every room in the house and bless all the rooms with the holy water. And when the priest was coming into the house, it was, this always stayed with me, um, because he was bringing the Eucharist into the house. You just didn't take that for granted. My mom said you'd have to meet the priest at the door with a lighted candle, a blessed candle. And, um, you know, wherever the altar was set up, if it was over here, You'd, you'd lead the priest over by the lighted candle and then he would uh, get his vestments on and put the Eucharist down and, and start to say a Mass. And where, so, what room typically was that set in in your house? Usually in the kitchen we had the Mass said because we had the big long t kitchen table, but we had like called the sitting room where the breakfast would be served yeah. afterwards. Yeah. Um, how, was, uh, how was death treated? How, what were the customers? Very, very sadly. I remember three deaths in my house, my two uncles and my dad. And um, sickness was, was even treated very solemnly and very sad over there. If the ambulance was coming, it was like it was the end of the world. And my dad was quite, quite sickly in the end, and the ambulance had to come to our house, you know, quite a bit. And the ambulance over there is pure snow white with a red cross on the side of it. So the main road, you know, from our house, you could see it. So we, I would be sent out, you know, to the, um, like, back street or something and told to watch for the ambulance. And that was like, you were like, I was petrified because I knew they were coming to take my dad. It was like, it was just so sad. And... Um, even if he was coming back, it was like he never was going Well, back. you didn't know, you know. It was kind of like almost the end of the line, you know. But he, he always came back. And then um, uh, when they, when my two uncles and my dad died, uh, we had them waked in the house. And um, we had a neighbor, an elderly woman, that laid them out in the, cas in the cassocks, which were the brown habits that were so awful. They were so... Oh, so n so n not so pretty a thing. They were brown, and uh, that's what everybody wore at the time. Now, these days, I understand you cannot have any kind of clothing, mm -hmm. but back then it was the brown. You got it. You had to go get it from the priest, and it was. Um, and they were they weren't embalmed or anything. They were laid out in their own bed, mm -hmm. and the evening before they were taken out to go to the church, which usually happened in the evening, they the, all the neighbors would come in like to. Uh, um, you know, pay their respects, and then it was like kind of like a party. They had like sandwiches and tea and, and drinks and stuff like that. But there was a real sadness attached to it. You know what I mean? Then that evening, the corpse was taken to the church, and there was like a not a mass, but a, like a service. And then the following morning would be the burial. And even now, because I went back for my brother's funeral two years ago. They walk after the casket from the church to the to the graveyard. It's a nice custom. Yeah, it's very nice, yeah. but it's very sad. Yeah, yeah. Was all your family buried in one yes. area? Yes, oh, in one area. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah. That's nice. Um, 
eventually you decided, and you said a little earlier, you were going to come to the States because that was kind of decided for you. you right. Had enough family here that yeah. you were bringing. Yeah. And, uh, um, and so you were then chosen your parents. How did your parents feel about that? Uh, my mom, I know, with, I saw all my siblings leave because I was old enough when Tom left to remember that it was like the saddest day in the world, and she cried for days afterwards. And if she went over in the room and saw his clothes, she would cry for days. So I was thinking to myself, there's no way that I can possibly ever put her through this again because then Tom left, Bridie left, Anne left, Christina left, and I, I, Jimmy came after me. And I'm thinking, I'm just going to stay because I can't I break my mother's heart again by leaving. She because, went through that with each other. Yes, time. but she she kept saying that it was a wonderful thing, and we were so lucky to be able to get to this country, you know. And she called it, you know, the land of plenty. And uh, she pretended all the time that she was very happy about it, but I know deep down inside she was just totally heartbroken. Mm. Yeah. So uh, anyway, the papers were sent, and um, I was pulled out of school. And the next thing, I was on my way to Dublin for my physical but I'd never been to Dublin before and scared to death. And how did you get there? I got a bus. Uh -huh. And I, we did have relatives in Dublin that I was able to stay with overnight. And then I remember going to the consulate the next day, and I was hoping that I wouldn't pass, that I could come home and say I wasn't going. Mm -hmm. But of course, I was fortunate enough to pass. And then um, they started getting me ready, and I remember they get, got me some new clothes, and I was totally sad about the whole thing. You didn't really want to leave? No. I wanted to leave because I, I thought it probably was a great thing to come to America, but I didn't want her to be that sad yes. over because I would be the, more or less the last one. Jimmy never really intended to come to this country, and then he did later, but um, I was kind of the last of the Mohegans that was mm -hmm. going to... so. There was no more girls left. Uh, my older br sister was married over there. So there was nobody home with my mom, and uh, I felt really bad about that. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. So you got yourself together? And I got myself together, and I landed what, what in New York. The, what was the day like going from the house? How it was you? so sad that I, I was like I was going to my grave, I guess. The, my mom came with me to uh, to Shannon because I flew over here, and they got a driver to take us. And I remember them. We went into this restaurant. They were going to have you know a big time of a meal. You know, I couldn't even swallow. I was so so sad. And they waited, and at that time you could wait to see the plane. You know, and when I looked back, I could still see them. You know. Uh, In the window. Did you, who went besides your mother? Your my mother? brother, my older brother, he always Michael. went. Yeah. yeah that's what, did. what date was that? What that date? was, I came in July. July. 1956. Okay. And my brother Tom met me in New York, and it was a sweltering hot day, and the cars were tooting, and you know, everybody, you know how it is down at the airport. And I think I saw the first black people that I'd ever seen, uh -huh. and I was petrified. And I remember Tom, you know, how Tom is with his lingo, um, getting out of the airport and, the, you know, the cars weren't moving and he says, just drive it or park it. <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, I'm in America. <laughs> so we landed up at Tom's house and of course his wife Nora was alive at the time and she had a nice meal for us. And um, all my sisters were there and it seemed like a happy time. but. Uh, I knew that I was going to be sad, you know, for a while. So for a whole year, I cried every night going to bed. Oh, yeah. Every night. I listened to, um, without never changing the channel, I listened to country music because that had some kind of meaning, you know. Yeah. And my sister Bridie worked for a family in Westport. They were the Tates, and they were multi, multi-millionaires. They had a cook, and she was the chambermaid, which was, you know, the waitress and that kind of stuff for the family. And this woman across the street um, had heard that Bridie had a sister coming from Ireland, and she was a young mother. She had three children, and she um, asked Bridie, could she meet me when I came? So I was only here two days when uh, Bridie walked me over to meet this woman and her husband and her three small children. They were just five and six or something at the time. 
and um, she wanted to know if I'd like to go to work for her. And of course, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I really wanted to go to school. I always wanted to be a nurse. But anyway, the next thing I found myself over there, living in, taking care of these children and the house, and these people traveled a lot, and it was a very desolate place in Westport. And of course, I had Brady across the street, but it was, it was not a, you know, I didn't feel at home at all. And every afternoon, I would get like a break in the afternoon, I would walk over to Brady and we'd go for walks. And um, I told Brady every day that I wanted to go back to Ireland. And she said, okay, you know, just give it a little time and da 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 da. When you get your fare made, you know, in the bank or whatever, then you can think about it, you know. And um, I had a boyfriend in Ireland too that I was really very interested in. And I thought, oh, that's good. I'm going to just go to the bank on my day off, which was Thursday, go straight to the People's Bank. And they paid me $40 a week, which was big money then. And I practically put it all in the bank because I was going to save up my fare. And then before you know it, I started to get out of that mindset. And um, I kind of got used to it here. And I never went back for five years afterwards. Wow. But you had the money saved up. How long did it yeah. take you to to Not go. that long, because I didn't buy a thing. Yeah. I didn't buy a stitch of clothes, nothing. I just kept a little bit of spending money. The rest went in the, in the bank. And so you knew any time you mm -hmm. would go if you yeah. decided to. But I also knew, Peg, that when I went back, I'd be almost like a failure, because you just didn't go back. You know what I mean? You didn't go back and say you were homesick, you couldn't make a go of it here. You only went back if you said you were very successful and America was the land of the free and the home of the brave and it was terrific over there. And the, definitely the money was on the streets uh -huh. and all that kind of thing. So you didn't go back with that mindset. Yeah. So I knew that. So with the result, I didn't go back. How did you keep in touch with the family back home? Every letter. I still have some of the letters that my mom wrote to me. Practically every week I had a letter from her. That was the connection, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't write that much to my brothers or sisters, but my mom was like, there, there was no telephones. We never called. Wow. Must nope. have been hard not to hear her voice. Oh, you have no idea. Yeah. <gasps> and then little by little, you know, she started to not feel well, and I went back two or three times, and she wasn't well. She had an enlarged heart. And, uh, you know, you just did what you could while you were there, but you knew you had to leave. And then finally, um, I think it was in 1978, um, she wrote me from the hospital, and I still have that letter. And she wasn't doing well. And my sister said, you know, anybody that wanted to come, it looked like it was, she wasn't going to, you know, come home. So I went, and I, um, Jimmy, Jimmy was here then too, and he came with me, and we were with her a whole week in the hospital, and she passed away on a Sunday morning. While you were there. While we were there. Yeah, that was lucky that you yeah. were able to be there. Yeah. 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 So that was, I lost my connection then pretty much, you know, with, yeah. with home after that. Yeah. Even though I have, you know, brothers and a, and a sister. But it was like part of you just yeah. went. Yeah. Did your children, well, did, you're married. I know mm -hmm. you're married to uh, Frank. Frank yeah. McCormick. Yeah. Um, and how did you, how did you meet Frank? Well, that's interesting, um, you know, around at the dances and stuff. Of course, for me, it was, uh, I, I got to be around him more because he used to go to his brother's, Joe's house, my sister Bridie, and, uh, uh, you know, we'd bump into each other and little by little, we kind of fancied each other and uh, we, it became an item. Yeah. When did you get married? 1960. Okay. And, and you have children? Four. Children. Yeah, and yeah. four grandchildren. Yeah. yeah. Where's Frank from? Uh, Roscommon. Roscommon. Okay. Yeah. So you would never have met him if you'd stayed home? Probably right? not, no. Yeah. I was fortunate enough, though, to go over and meet all his family before they, his family is completely wiped out. There's nobody there. Wow. Yeah. Wow. They now, just, do your children, have your children all had the opportunity? We to went uh, four years ago. We um, took the whole family, children, grandchildren. We rented out three houses and three cars, and they all came, and we had a ball. Sounds fabulous. It was so good, and they loved Ireland. Was it in Galway? Did you go to well, Galway? we rented it, which is, you know, where you can find these little cottages yes. to rent. It was actually in Clare, 
but it was only like about 45 minutes from my home place. And did you, when you got to your home place, were you among your family? Oh, then? yes. And then we had them all over, and we had a big, big shindig before, before we left. So oh. it was just terrific. And my brother was alive at the time. Oh, even yeah. better. Yeah. yeah. It was better. really great. Yeah. Now, what are your children's names? My children are, my oldest daughter is Mary, and she's married to an Italian, and that, her name is Soretta. And my grandson, John, is getting married next set Friday, my he oldest graduated. grandchild. He just graduated from law school. Wow. And um, he's marrying a, a girl. Her father, her father is from County Kerry, oh. uh, from New Fairfield, and they're getting married next Friday. And she's a nurse. That's <clears throat> that's Mary. My son Patrick lives down on Fairfield Beach, and he has two baby grandchildren, two and a half and one and a half. And uh, he's married to an American girl. She's from Michigan. My my son Tim works on the railroad. He's an engineer with Metro North, and Karen is in, uh, living in Stratford, and she's a lawyer. She is. I didn't realize yeah. that was a lawyer. Yeah. Very nice. So did uh, your son Tim take his profession after his father? Well, it was kind of a roundabout way. He, Tim just wasn't a school person, and he just came home. He was going to Norwalk Tech, and he came home one evening and threw the books all over the floor, and he says, to heck with this. I'm not going back to school. And his father said, well, if you're not going to do that, you better get going and find a job. So Tim tried a few different things with heating and air conditioning, and he didn't like any of them. And Frank said, would you be interested in... Uh, if I talk to somebody at, on the railroad, and you might get a job as a conductor. And of course, with all Frank's years, he just retired after 48 years with the railroad, he got him a job. And Tim didn't last a week being a conductor. He couldn't stand dealing with the public. <laughs> they, were, they were obnoxious. And so he decided to go to engineering school, and now he drives the train, and he yes. doesn't have to deal with the people. And he likes that. And he's very happy That's with very it. very good. You yeah. know, you just have to find your right spot, yeah. right? Yeah. But, of course, his father was, like, ready to oh, sure. throw him out of the house, you know, <laughs> because he wouldn't do it. And I said, why don't you just leave him alone, let him find his own way, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's right. you got to do it. <gasps> yeah. yeah. Um, how did you get to be a member of the Gaelic American Club? Oh, that was so easy when I came over. I was very much tied down in the in the house that I worked in because the, she had young children. Of course, I was the babysitter. Yeah. And um, every once in a while, she would decide, maybe like at 8 or 9 o'clock at night, that I could have the evening off. She was kind of a, you know, she, she would treat me like a, she was my mother more than my employer. Mm -hmm. And so I would go to the dances in New Haven. You know, and variety and when Joe would take me, and then I would go to the dances in Bridgeport. And uh, of course, we heard about the Gaelic Club, you know, down on Hurd Avenue and then on Goodsell Street. And um, on Thursday of my day off, we I would go there or any other time that I was free. Yeah. And we had great times. Yeah. Great times. Yeah. So you, you've had the whole history of it. You've oh, been back yeah. all the way. Yes, there. I was around when Pat Flaherty was the president for year after year after year. <laughs> Eddie Gallagher and the whole uh, Jean Gina Castellot, yeah, yeah, yeah. She was secretary, she was for, secretary for years, years. Yeah. 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 But I saw all the presidents that are on the wall there, and you know, worked under them, and it was, you know, we thought we had like this fantastic club. Oh, yeah. You know, we didn't have fifty dollars in the bank, but it was a great club yeah. because it was a great meeting place. Right. And if it wasn't for the club, we probably never would have met our mates. Because, you know, you were apprehensive, like, to go into any other kind of places to meet people, you know, right, right. where today, like, they go to the clubs and the bars and right. all that kind of stuff. It wasn't in the times. We didn't do that back then. Yeah, yeah. So the only place we went, really, was to the club in New Haven and to the, to the Gaelic Club here. Yeah. And they were hopping places at the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure did. did you ever become a citizen? Oh, yes. You did? Yeah. As soon as I was five years here, I became a citizen. You did? Yeah. yeah. Um, when uh, when you first came here, you said you were it wasn't a real easy adjustment to make. You weren't real happy. About no, being not there. at all. Yeah. Not at all. What what were the things you missed most about being at home, aside from your uh, mom? I think the family, and I felt like it was like I was at the other end of the world because th there wasn't the connection. You see, there wasn't the phone. There was no phones, mm -hmm. and the only thing was was the letter. And of course, that was great, but it, you still didn't have the contact. You know. 
and I missed, I think I missed all the little